After more than two and a half years of conflict, stress and nervousness have become commonplace for most Ukrainians. The UN Commissioner Volker Turk says Ukraine's population is, quote, trapped in cycles of terror because of the ongoing Russian attacks on Ukraine's civilian infrastructure. Millions of Ukrainians continue to face relentless Russian aggression. Many have lost their loved ones and their homes. According to Ukrainian officials, almost half the Ukrainian population has been affected and needs psychological support. In Kyiv, DW asked some residents how they have been coping with the war. It affects both the general and the internal, the emotional and the physical, at all levels, both nationally and individually. I feel partly combative, partly confused, because the fear does not go away. I won't say I'm used to it, but children shouldn't be shown this moment of fear and uncertainty. Specifically, if we consider the psychological state, I did not have such active panic attacks. For example, if you look at my friends and relatives, some of them have had them, including my mother. You start to see your life from a different perspective, and you don't stop for some kind of reflection. You try to live every day, every minute, every second here and now, because here and now, this life can suddenly end. Ukraine's First Lady Olena Zelenska has been the face of a campaign called How Are You? The website encourages people to seek mental health support. First year of the full-scale invasion, we received so many calls uh, regarding acute stress and different acute emotional reactions. But the second year of the full-scale invasion regarding our observation, it's more about, you know, some depressive disorders or some anxiety disorders in general. And we also observed some uh, that the level of um, calls from people who need some psychiatric help is also increased. Experts say there is currently only one psychologist for every 100,000 people in Ukraine, a number which should be increased at least five-fold. We need to empower workforce in Ukraine, maybe social workers, maybe nurses, and allow them to provide different services of low intensity and um, to help as many as possible. With no signs of the war coming to an end soon, Ukraine will have to continue its efforts to ease the mental health crisis. For more on that, we're now joined by Robert van Voren. He's a human rights and mental health expert and is teaching at the university in Kaunas uh, in Lithuania. Now, uh, let's assume for a moment there is something like a national psyche, a common psychological experience for all citizens. Uh, how has that changed in Ukraine or been affected by the war? Well, I think one of the positive uh, developments is, of course, that human that mental health has become has been mainstreamed. Um, this is something that uh, was not there before the invasion. Uh, mental health was still something uh, not very much discussed, in particular when it got to uh, uh, mental illnesses, to psychiatric uh, issues. That is something that has disappeared. Uh, the only problem I see is that uh, very often normal reactions. Uh, that people have, like uh, anxiety, panic, uh, depression, suicidal thoughts sometimes um, are, uh, we call, psychiatricalized, whereas actually they're quite normal in a situation like this, uh, people have these feelings. And um, the thing is, of course, that people are extremely resilient. We can overcome a lot of things. And so the the risk is that by... Uh, making uh, situations more psychiatric, we forget that actually uh, helping people to return to their lives and reconnect with families and reconnect with their societies is actually uh, much more important and solves most of mm. the problems.
Now, uh, we've known about the uh, effect that PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, has on combat soldiers uh, for a long time. But is it now equally important to focus on the mental health of those in war zones who are not directly involved in the fighting? I think, you know, the, the big problem is that those who are fighting, and we're talking about uh, probably around one million now Ukrainians who have frontline experience, uh, that we are uh, probably looking at at least 100,000 Ukrainian military or foreign military who will be needing professional support. And it's not only these military, they're part of a society, they're part of a family. And uh, so um, uh, when you, you know, take this broader context, then actually a, f a sizable part of the population will have to deal with the consequences of the type of war that is now being waged. And this war is a war that Europe hasn't seen for a very long time. Mm. Uh, it's a trench war, it's close combat, it's uh, a static, um, a lot of violence, uh, probably quite similar to what was happening in, for instance, Northern France during mm. the First World War. And so the statistics that we have from countries like Britain with uh, veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, um, the question is to what extent this actually can be you know, related to what is going on in Ukraine. Uh, the future, I'm, I'm afraid, will go. Just a very, very quick uh, answer, please. Uh, with so many people in need of psychological treatment, is that humanly possible to actually do that? It is possible if you forget the idea that it's only mental health professionals who need to help. Peer-to-peer -peer support is going to be very important. Veterans helping uh, veterans. Um, uh, social workers, nurses, uh, other other people related to the mental health field, uh, mm. they can really do a lot. And then on top of that, people themselves can do a lot. Self-help mm. is really going to be a very important element here. Robert Van Voren, the human rights and mental health expert, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. We can now talk to Hans Kluger. He is a Europe director for the World Health Organization and joins me from Kiev. Uh, welcome uh, to DW. Uh, Mr. Kluge, your organization estimates that almost 10 million people in Ukraine are at risk of a mental health condition because of the war. How can you possibly help that many people? Today we had a meeting with the First Lady, Madame Olena Zelenska, who is coordinating the large national mental health program. And actually she was telling, in principle, Every single person is affected mental health. So what WHO is doing with the Ministry of Health is a lot of self-help courses online. The issue is to take out the mental health management from the institutions to the communities to the primary health care and work with a lot of peers. But of course, it's massive. If you ask the children... What are you concerned about is the fear for missiles, the fear for attacks. Now, you were just mentioning those fears. Uh, are those the most common mental health conditions or what other conditions are there? There is a whole spectrum going from severe post-traumatic stress syndrome for people who have been on the front line to fatigue, burnout, anxiety, depression in between. So it's a whole spectrum, but a lot of those can be managed by relatively simple techniques. The key issue is that there should be no stigma and discrimination. People should talk about it. It is okay not to be okay. Now, working through trauma takes time and a safe environment. What if this war continues for another year, two, three well, this is actually why I'm here, because after three years, we see a little bit of international fatigue, usually a catastrophe, an emergency, the needs go down. But here, as long as the war continues, the needs actually are increasing, particularly with what I think will be the worst winter of the three. There are so many attacks on the civilian energy infrastructure. I mean, even our staff, they have six hours out of 24 hours a day electricity. So this automatically impacts every human being. The war has to stop. The most important medicine is peace. Mm -hmm. 
The uh, WHO says that the huge need for support requires innovative solutions uh, from the health authorities. Uh, you've touched upon this, but uh, what are the, uh, these innovative solutions? Yesterday, I was opening with the Minister of Health, Dr. Victor Lashko, the e-health summit. And people were honestly and saying that the war, sadly, drove the innovation, for example, on e-prescription, that things are going digitally, especially in hard-to-reach areas, frontline, rural areas, where people can have consultations, for example, through telemedicine also, because the biggest crisis is the health workforce crisis. I was in a hospital in Chukwif, and there were 800 health workers, and since the war, only 120. So every single healthcare worker has to work for five. Now, if we say there is such a thing as a national psyche, what is this war doing to Ukraine's national psyche, to the collective experience of a nation? I have a double feeling here. When each time I come, I speak to the patients, the community, the nurses. It are heartbreaking stories. But at the same time, I'm always so energized and inspired by the resilience. I mean, we have to realize that it's a miracle that the health system is still standing, is still functioning. Of course, the cost of medicines becomes a big problem, but the health system somehow is surviving despite of the fact that we have 2,000 attacks on healthcare facilities, which is the number one problem. There are about two attacks a day on health, and these attacks on ambulances, on doctors, on nurses have to stop. The WHO's Europe Director, Hans Kluger there, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.